This is Coda Radio, episode 515, for April 25th, 2023. Hey friend, welcome into Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly talk show. Taking a pragmatic look at the art and the business of software development and the world of technology. My name is Chris, and joining us, reading through those Twitter threads, it's our host, Mr. Dominic. Hello, Mike. Hello, hello, and uh, I think we should start with a solemn pouring one out for our good man, the Tuckster. Oh, yeah? Yeah, you think? Yeah, I uh, I love it. I just love, I, I'm a bit of a chaos monkey. I love to see these news networks in chaos. Word is, is that Fox News has a couple of bad months coming to them with some extra lawsuits. I'm just popping the popcorn. I couldn't be happier about it. <laughs> I, I also like how these stars think that, you know, ah, oh, I'm untouchable. Yeah. Nothing will ever happen to me. And King Rupert's like, actually, I don't give a And the hot goss is, is right now is there might have been some producer tomfoolery that perhaps begun a process that took him out from the knees. Taken out by the inside. I forgot her last name, but Abby, uh, something with a G. Yeah. You know, um, I thought the hottest goss of the day was going to be Elon's extremely strange alt account where he pretends to be uh, like a three-year-old or something like that. And talks about how much he likes Japanese girls. Also, apparently, uh, has a bit of a preoccupation with uh, FTX and, uh, and the conspiracy that FTX was a laundering service for uh, Ukraine and Democrats. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that's a, that's a kid that's hip to world events, I'll say. Over 10,000 people started to f- were following the account before it got deleted, including uh, your personal close dear friend, California Governor Gavin Newsom was one of the followers of the account. Uh, yes, my, my, yeah, I'm, I'm often deeply friendly with... Uh, yeah, I know you guys go to the French Garden, um, you know, French Garden. and uh, enjoy a maskless lunch. <laughs> you, you don't out me here, but we secretly have brunch with Kara Swisher all the time. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, does she wear her sunglasses at brunch? I don't, I don't actually think they're real sunglasses. I think they're like fused. Right, right. Yeah, so um, I guess he was pretending to be, you know, his kid. And uh, it's so funny to watch Elon beg for engagement and basically, you know, troll large accounts and try to pick up followers. I have to imagine it must have been cathartic to just not be known, to be almost invisible in a way. Right. To be able to be the troll you want to be without the SEC suing you the next day. It's just, why did he have to go weird with it? You know? Because he is weird, man. Come on. Yeah. Oh, right. Right. Of course. That's, that's, that's why. Yeah. It's funny. He outed it himself by sharing a screenshot where he was bragging that he was making a, over 100K a month now with the new Twitter subscription feature. So there you go, kids. If you got nearly 30 million followers, a tiny fraction of them will subscribe to your content and you can make $100,000 a month. It's a lot of money. Is it? A Wait month, a minute. Not a year. A month. Okay. A month. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. I was yeah. like, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, but I was, I was watching a recent interview with Elon. I think it might've been your buddy, uh, Tucker. And, um, I like how I have so many friends now. Yeah. Well, you're a social guy. And yeah. I could tell just in some of his answers that he is, he is truly obsessed, right? That's why he bought it. He is obsessed with Twitter. His a lot, way too much of that man's life revolves around Twitter. It's, it's, it's pretty frightening. Um, you know, I, I kind of, I mean, we shouldn't spend all our time talking about Twitter because that's what the Vox Media Podcast is for. But I'm amazed at how not well it's going. In what sense? Like the ads have never been cheaper. They're also really not, I mean, I'm thinking of it from a business perspective. Yeah. They're really shitty though. See, I feel the other way. I'm impressed that he dropped 80% of the staff for better or for worse. The service remains online. And according to them, uh, unique users are more active than ever on the platform right now. This must be something about how I'm following people because I've been getting like the craziest crypto bullshit, you know? Oh yeah, there's so much of that. I, I agree. To me, the signal seems worse. I don't even really think to go to Twitter anymore just because it's gotten boring. The issue is, and maybe it's for, it actually, I think it's for the best. I have not replaced it with anything because the Mastodon feed just doesn't really work for me for it whatever reason. It doesn't work. Yeah, Mastodon's broken. And you know, I've noticed um, a couple, like the Asahi open source project to get Linux on the MacBooks, they have they were starting to feel like they disappeared when they left Twitter. They went to Mastodon and people thought the project had ended. And now they've had to reverse course and come back to Twitter 
and say, no, we're still here. Here's some of the things we've been working on. Sorry that you thought we were gone. Because nobody heard from them when they went to Mastodon. Well, it's, it's one of the things. Like a lot of the people I keep in touch with in the community, I used to keep in touch with almost exclusively via Twitter, uh, you know, DMs or just you know, public messages or whatever. And now I feel like those kind of acquaintance relationships are just like on ice. Yeah. Weird, weird, weird. Well, that's time to build real relationships. Short notice, but we are having a meetup this Saturday as you're listening. Saturday, April 29th, 2023, 1 p.m. at the Boston Haba in Olympia, Washington. And I'm told this is a gem of a spot. And it's supposed to be 78 degrees, blue skies Ooh. on the Pacific Northwest Coast. It's going to be. Are you going to Boston? No, it's called the Boston Marina Harbor and it's in Olympia, Washington. They just oh. call them. Yeah. <laughs> I, oh. know. I know. It threw me for a loop too. But no, there's a. There's like a, a restaurant and a harbor and where we're going to be like this beautiful deck over the water. And they call it the Boston Harbor Marina. Really looking forward to it because it's close enough to Oregon that I think we could pick up some Portlanders and folks in, you know, maybe Salem and sort of that general area. I always like talking to the Coder listeners. They always ask if Mike will be there. I haven't left my house since 1974. <laughs> All right. So uh, we got a killer email and, uh, Mouse Down Mike, a.k.a. Listener Mike, who uh, some of you might recall took us up in his Cessna when we were in Denver. Um, fantastic chap. He sent in, well, he was going to send in a whole bunch of boosts, but it was a really long message. So he sent it in via email and then sent along 155,554 sats. Yeah, it's a brilliant way to do it. So, Mike, do follow up if I don't uh, do your email justice. Uh, and, uh, you know, what? I'll put the entire email in here. It's a, it's a real beauty and a lot to think about across multiple topics that we've talked about recently. So I asked Mike's good buddy, ChatGPT, to uh, kind of put this down into something digestible on the show. So let's see how it does. Because uh, Mike's main point was, is we've recently talked about companies moving away from the cloud or going to the cloud, depending on how they're, what their cost basis is. And he says that one of the reasons a lot of these organizations are migrating to the cloud, they're doing it for the wrong reasons. Like they're getting great long-term contracts from cloud providers that are super cheap. And so they're like taking advantage of that right now and basically buying into infrastructure they don't really need. He says that a lot of people have this expectation that a cloud migration is going to just mean you save money. Uh, but if companies cannot realize the significant efficiencies in moving to the cloud, then you're not really going to just discover them. They're not just going to materialize. You need to figure out what those efficiencies are going to be before you migrate to the cloud because you don't just get them because cloud. In fact, if anything, I think you get a kind of a leaky model with the cloud and you can kind of find hidden costs that you didn't expect. Like I'm constantly realizing that, oh, I have a rig over here. Oh, geez. Right. Like that. It is a problem. Uh, and Mike also notes that the serverless model, which allows for computing storage on shared cloud resources, has been pretty revolutionary for scaling up as your application needs it and then scaling down when your application doesn't need it. And it's made it easier to isolate code from the implementation details. Yeah, I don't really. Yeah, I really. um I don't think serverless has uh, taken over like it was forecasted that everything would just be built for serverless, but it clearly has a lot of really nice use cases. And I think the biggest one that Mike touches on here is that kind of dynamic scaling. That's just gorgeous. But, you know, when we first started talking about it, it felt like it was going to take over the way all development was done and the way all services were hosted and that we were going to abstract everything away. And it just that hasn't really materialized. <laughs> as usual. <laughs> uh, the dreams that we used to have. He goes on to say, uh, good developers should be able to use patterns to isolate code and make it easier to switch different cloud providers without too much effort. So my, my thoughts around like, like the effort to jump from Azure to Google Cloud back to AWS, something like that, not a huge deal if you do it right. The biggest operational benefit of serverless seems to be having a cloud vendor and engineers that secure, maintain, and upgrade that core infrastructure for you. But with recent layoffs in the tech industry, you kind of have to wonder what's going on behind the scenes. It's a great point, he says. He points out. Uh, and despite some issues with AWS not yet supporting Python 3.10 on Lambda, there have been some good progress. But he recommends that uh, take caution with you. <laughs> Use caution when doing AWS serverless technologies. I'll put, if you're curious about any of these sections, I'll put his entire message. Because he also included some references from last week in aws.com and get and a couple links on github to talk about uh, aws lambda yes i think in the most in the most kind of perfect way it's all kind of come together with serverless but i think your words 
of wisdom around uh, figure out what the efficiencies are that you're gaining before you make the move and don't make the move and then figure out where your efficiencies are. That's, I feel like the way the salespeople push it, but it's backwards. So thank you, Mike. And Mike says he may join us at Linux Fest Northwest as well. Woot. I know. We should start plotting ways to get you out there, even if it's a long shot. You know, maybe we like, you know, pick up your house and drive it. I, I don't know. You know, this is, this is why you should get, you get an RV, you know, take your turlet with you. If I take enough spice, I think I could just fold space. <laughs> yes. Uh, I know it. You know, he also points out the nice thing about serverless is you could also save on like electrical and cooling resources too. That makes me think though, you know, I just picture if, if something like that, if we, if we, this is just, I'm just going to play the anarchist for a moment. Do we, do we really want a future where all of the major IT infrastructure is consolidated into just four companies? Because that, when you think about that from a talent standpoint, that's a big drain on talent, real consolidation on talent. It feels like if you, if you take that out over 20, 30 years, it's going to leave the market with disproportionately skilled and unskilled workers, people who are like an elite group that can manage these systems and run them, and then everybody else. I don't know. I mean, I don't think it's just going to consolidate into the big four on, in terms of hosting. There's... There's going to be a lot of hybrid hosting, a lot of places doing some on-prem, a lot of little hosts, you know, or not little, but like, you know, not the big four, like Linode and, and Dio and folks like that. It's, you got to remember, the big four are pretty expensive, right? Relative to, particularly, let's say, Azure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, though, if you're only paying for when you use it versus the cost of having gear on site running 24-7 that has people that know how to set it up, manage and repair it. Right, but it's not just the big four cloud hosts and on site. There are other options, such as like Linode, right? Right, right. So I, th I think, yeah, on prem is definitely going to be less of a thing for a lot of use cases. It already is. Eh. How dare you? How dare I you? I say it's, it's going all on prem all the time. That's what I say. We're all going to build server shacks. Yep. That's what we're doing. Server forget shacks. Forget the she shed, forget the man cave. Mm -hmm. The server shack is the new trend. <laughs> I would love that. And you know what I else? Know I'll would. put all my data on IPFS. What could go wrong? <laughs> With MongoDB, just in memory. So, you know what? Just don't lose power. You'll be fine. Linode.com slash coder. Head on over there to get $100 in 60-day credit on a new account. And what a great way to support the show while you check out fast, reliable cloud hosting built for developers. Seriously, try it for your next project and just see what I'm talking about. It's what we've used for everything we've deployed since we've gone independent. It's the best platform I've used in 18 years of doing this. And Linode really makes it work because they've got a great UI, a fantastic, well-documented, clean API. They support a bunch of infrastructure management tooling if that's what you want to use, like your Kubernetes or your Ansible's or your Terraforms. It supports all of that, or you can just use their clean dashboard. And maybe you've been racking and stacking for 20 years, or maybe it's going to be the first server you've ever deployed. The UI can scale to your expertise level. Then they have a ton of documentation, really good stuff, and 24-7, 365, human support. You call up, you get an actual human being. It's not a robot. It's not chat GPT pretending to solve your problems. It's actual humans, trained, geeks that love this stuff. That matters so much when you've got like an outage or a question that has to be answered right away, especially when you're using it in production like we do. They offer MVME storage right there on the PCI bus. So you just have massive IOPS. It's so awesome. And so if you're a performance hound, Linode is a no brainer. But if you're a value hound, is that a term? If you're sniffing out value, check out their nanodes. Just try, try one out and see what you can get going on there. It's really impressive. They have one click deployments of really popular packages like GitLab or Zoom replacements or all-in-one NextCloud stacks, or you just build it up from the ground using just about any distribution you'd like. They've already got Fedora 38 on there, if that's how you roll. So go try it, see it for real, support the show, and get that $100 for 60 days. You go to linode.com slash coder. That's linode.com slash coder. So there was a appeal on the decision around Apple's new rules about where developers can and can send users to make payments and potentially about sideloading apps. Mike's good buddy, Tim Sweeney, was leading the charge on that. 
And Apple got their verdict. So many friends. And uh, it seems that the appeals court has upheld the status quo in the epic antitrust lawsuit against Apple. But it overall is probably mostly in favor for Apple. It's uh, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals found that Apple's closed app store and security restrictions didn't violate antitrust law, but that Apple couldn't maintain anti-steering rules that prevent users from learning about alternative payment options, i.e. Apple can't stop you from sending somebody to your website to pay for something. Uh, Tim Sweeney said that uh, he felt that the ruling was, quote, a decision to reject Apple's anti-steering policies is a win. Fees for iOS developers to send consumers to the web to do business with them directly there, quote, we're working on next steps. So there may be some more to figure. There may be more lawsuits to come. But Apple's spinning this as a massive victory, and Tim Sweeney's spinning this as a bit of a win because the anti-steering rules remain. So this sort of affirms, this has now been, I, I, maybe Apple will challenge it again. I don't know if they can, but this sort of is right now codifying in law that if you wanted to have a subscription, I, I'm, the way I'm reading this, say you, Mike, wanted to have a subscription for Alice, you could now just put a link to your website and not have to do an in-app purchase, right? Mm -hmm. You still got to pay that 30%. Right, okay, yeah, yes. And that's something that sounds like Sweeney wants to try to challenge, still. Yeah, so he lost twice, right? Mm -hmm. Because uh, I'm pretty sure, I mean, I guess on some level, Apple cares a little about you having that link or button, which is worded very strangely, as uh, Nilay Patel will tell you, which is going to be another fight. But let's just take the sane layman interpretation that it's like a button or a link, click it, you go to a web page. You now have a actual contractual uh, requirement to report your sales to Apple and pay them 30%. So I don't see how this is a win at all for Epic because unless I'm really dumb, I think the underlying problem here is not that Epic really, really wants to build a web store and still give Apple 30%. It's that they would like to build the web store and take some percentage from other people, like they do in the Epic Game Store, right? Right. So it's 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 not a win. Yeah. I mean, thirty percent is a serious cut when you're not using any of Apple's payment infrastructure, right? Well, like also, it's it can be fifteen in many cases. And one thing I found kind of disturbing: a lot of the like non-developer focused reporting on this has been simply inaccurate. It is not the case that that percentage is zero for your first year if you make less than a million dollars. That is bullshit. That percentage is 15%, and they have some pretty, that is a not-so-easy process to go to to get that lowered. It still feels like a win, though. It, you know, In I what mean, way? It's, it, it, I guess it, it does. Apple is very much signaling this is a, a major victory for them, and I'm not buying it because this is a serious crack. This is, I think, a pretty big deal that you can link outside of Apple now for payments. I agree the cut still sucks, but... Doesn't this feel like the beginning of the shift for just the total absolute domination control they have over the App Store? Like we now, this is a crack. This is a big deal in a way. Yeah, but this is, a, this is they didn't get anything new. This is what they got from that, uh, I think it was Judge Daniels, yeah. right? Like, yeah, they, they, but it held. It held, the anti-steering stuff. It held. It Okay. I mean, I get what you're saying. You know, there's this big rumor about WWDC and side loading coming out. We talked about it last week. I don't buy that either. Isn't this how you might do it, though? If you wanted to sideload apps and have payments outside of it, you just codify. Fine, have added host, but you got to still give us 30%. And that just got held up in court perfectly in time. Okay. And then the only people that might make sense for are going to be the big spammy game companies, right? Maybe I'm too focused on my little indie slash medium sized developer world. I would rather just use Apple's payment system than have this in incredible accounting overhead. Yeah, I agree. And I also suspect what you'll see is you'll see some consolidation in payment processors that act as alternatives. So, you know, like maybe Stripe steps up and offers some kind of kit for developers just for the iPhone. And, you know, yeah, you're saving some money, but it, because of the economy of all of it, you end up just having maybe three, maybe a couple of other, like a Coke and a Pepsi implementation for developers that can be outside the App Store. And otherwise people are just going to use the App Store, right? Like that feels like where this goes next. Just because of the... The way this ruling came down, it kind of incentivizes like a large company to try to come in and consolidate those costs as much as possible to make a profit on top of it. Well, we should mention in the world of gaming that uh, 
Sega just bought the folks who make, I think, Candy Crush and a bunch of mobile games. It's like, for a Sega, this probably makes a ton of sense. Although maybe it doesn't, because why go through the hassle if you're still going to pay the 30%? Because you know Sega makes more than a million a year, despite their best efforts to lose money. Yeah, I, I wonder. Okay, all right. So let's say Microsoft ships their streaming game store or whatever, some sort of app store system that's in a web view. And all the purchases that are done in this store are all done using Microsoft points. And so the only time a transaction takes place is when you buy points. So that would be the only time Microsoft would have to give it. And then all of the internal day-to-day purchases are happening using Microsoft points and Apple isn't getting a cut of that. Yeah, you can already do that though, right? That's how Magic Arena works. You can buy your gems on a PC or a Mac or you, or you can buy them in the App Store and you log into your account. Let's say you always buy them on the web or on your, you know, your computer. Oh, and it'll be on the mobile device. And it's on the mobile ah, device. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's been a thing for years. Huh. Like, I thought, okay. The, 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 the objection, so the Microsoft store case, Apple had a different objection, right? It's that they wouldn't approve a single app that Microsoft could then add additional games to without each individual game being approved. Remember, it was a whole thing. It came out in the trial, the, uh, the Epic trial. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think Apple says anything about this app store stuff at WWDC? You know, anything about addressing like, you know, maybe like reviewing recent improvements they've made to make developers happy or do they just not even like the last few WWDCs the app store beyond just that's a place where you put your apps doesn't even come up anymore there were times before where they go up on stage and say here's how we're addressing your feedback in the app store especially in like the second more technical keynote and none of that happens anymore they just don't even talk about the policies or review process or changes they're making to streamline stuff they just don't does that change this year? I know there's a lot of there's a lot of smoke around it, right? I just given that it's it seems like the only thing and this is a, a a par quote of again the lovely Judge Daniels, who I have never met or know, but I just think if you read her rulings, they're very funny. Yeah, not a good buddy, but maybe one day. One day. I not not as close as like me and my good old friend Dick Cheney, who I yeah. think is dead. Right. Is dead. Uh, no, nope, nope. No, nope. still, still, still living in the suit like Vader. Still, still good. Okay. You'll notice because Liz Cheney's shoulders will slump as Dad lets go of the strings. Wow, you're gonna have to stand by that one, buddy. You don't like Liz Cheney? I, I, I didn't say it. I, I see. I just think like Liz is a fun name. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, what? I've never met a woman named Liz who wasn't like kind of fun. Yeah, like you know, like a Karen. but they're always like who? Like a Karen. <laughs> I've never met someone named Karen who was nice. So, you know, there's that. That's what I'm saying. All right. So back to WWDC, Karen. Why would Apple volunteer? I say get ahead of it. Here's why. If you're, if you're truly savvy about this stuff, Apple, all they have to do is just put a little chud in the water and the fanboys will help amplify the message. You know, all these Apple podcasts. We're talking about Marco again, aren't we? I mean, all of them, dude. There's, in, there's, there's hundreds of them that talk about stuff going on with the iPhone and the, you know, the watch and the devices. And they all kind of, over time, sort of hone in on a, a message, a talking point, right? You've, you've noticed this. And I think it's a really, when Apple utilizes that to their advantage, I think it's really clever. And you'll see this sometimes when they have a big release and they'll go put like Frederiki on there or something, or not Frederiki, uh, what's his name? The guy with the shirt. Craig. Uh, Is it Federici? Craig, Craig Federici. Federici. Yeah. yeah. Craig. Yeah. They'll put Hair Force One on a podcast and, you know, that, that kind of stuff works really well for them. And I think if they got, if like they put Craig out there, he's got great hair going, he's got his top button, maybe a little too unbuttoned. No such thing, Craig. Craig, I support you with that. Yeah. Okay. Keep it up. He's got that MacBook glow <laughs> and uh, he gets out there. He just says, today, we're really excited to tell you about some improvements we're making to the app store for you the developers, right? And they just kind of get ahead of it. They put this positive Apple spin on everything. And I think that would actually, instead of saying nothing and letting essentially Sweeney and disgruntled developers and senators who want to get famous for going after big tech setting the narrative, Apple sets the narrative. And if they don't address it, they're going to let all these other actors set the narrative for them. Sure. My my problem is, amazingly, I seem to have been wrong. And these rumors about the headset, I mean, they're getting pretty firm, right? This is, and this is There's how a lot Apple of smoke. does it. There's a lot of smoke. Yeah. Right. We're already at the end of April. You know, I, I imagine by, you know, Mother's Day, we're going to have some more information. 
that's a big, big bet, that headset. And wouldn't you want to put as much wood behind that very risky arrow to try to make it successful at your developer conference as possible? Yeah. I mean, yeah, sure. You could announce, and here's our new thing to, you know, a new thing for like UI button to do your outside payment stuff or whatever. I could see that, but I don't see like a major concession. I, yeah, it could just do it through product hype, especially if they're like, and you know, you all qualify for a developer edition headset that you'll get for free, but you have to send it back to us like that. Oh, kind they're, of, they're, first of all, they've done that before. Yeah. And they it's love not it. free. You have to put a $500 deposit. Right. Right. Yeah. But still, but we'll still do it. no, I, yeah, I believe that, but I'm just saying like this, I guess this is where I'm super skeptical of the AR VR thing. Me too. Oh, you are. I am. I mean, okay. I could see Apple finally just shipping because I got to get off the pot kind of a situation. But honestly, if we came on Coder after WWDC and there was never a headset announced, I'm not going to be shocked. I think they've gone too far down the, the line. I know. In fact, I think they shouldn't announce it because I agree with you. Unless they have made some orders of magnitude improvement over uh, the Quest, right? Because this is basically what, what Meta is doing. It is, Meta has an Android device and a headset. They've had it for years now. And Apple, like they always do, waits a while, and then they make their version. And this is going to be like an M-series chip. You know, maybe it'll even be an M2. And it's going to be really fancy. But it's just basically an iPad strapped to your head. So they've got to come up with a rich set of additional sensor input, maybe more cameras. They got to come up with a whole new set of APIs for developers to get access to. I'm hearing a lot of Benjamins though. Yeah. I mean, they're going to have to pay people to write apps. You know, we, we always talk about this when it's a new, when you're a big company and you're introducing a new product and you want developers to stop working on the thing that makes them money and start working on an unknown, you're going to have to pay them. And, you know, like it took Microsoft a while to come around to that and it made a difference when they finally did. I could see Apple, especially with like the arcade developers for the gaming aspect of this, I could absolutely see them. Yeah, but how much is this device itself going to cost when it goes to consumer? Yeah, we don't know. Word is 2K. See, now you kind of are making me think they won't release it. I don't think they should. I think they might. I think Apple's probably a little... Well, they need a... I, they yeah. need... Yeah, exactly. They need something right now because Microsoft and Google and Amazon, they're all going to run with AI. As they should, I mean... Apple's, it's this weird competitive thing these tech companies get into. And I also think that um, they want to get this product out. Just based on everything we've read, there's just been a lot of debate around it. And they've had a couple of things they've killed off recently, internal projects they've killed off that were big multi-year investments that they killed before they ever shipped. And now I think the internal dialogue is we don't want that to happen to the headset, so we're just going to have to ship it. Well, and Apple's at its happiest when it has a new product category, right? That's, and the product is in physical product. Yeah. Also, as you mentioned, kill products. They just murdered a bunch of their monitors that they were going to release. Yeah. According to the rumors, which is shameful, weird because I'm not sure that that Apple 5, like I, so I'm living the crazy MacBook Pro 96 gigs of RAM lifestyle right now because mm -hmm. I'm doing all that Unreal work. And I looked at buying one of those and the value prop was just super uh, bad. Yeah. I, like, I have to imagine the sales can't be that good, right? Because Apple plays this sort of like, we have this super excellent display game, but they're using the same panels other folks are. So if you just do a little savvy shopping, you can usually get the same panel. Like Might not Dell look as good. sells but, the same panel and yeah. they have a Thunderbolt edition. So it literally has, and it comes with a camera, right? It has all the advantages of the Apple one. Do you think it suggests that desktop sales are disappointing them? Because do you cancel a monitor project? Do you say, oh, we're not going to make the perfect desktop monitor when these desktops are flying off the shelves? I think we know that's not true. I read somewhere that the Mac Studio was a big hit. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Which makes sense, right? Because that, if you're running like a dev shop or a design shop, and you, you know, are like, like, let's, I, I don't want to trigger the Penguin people, but you probably want to run Macs, right? Especially if you're a design shop. The Mac Studio or even a souped up Mac Mini is a, is a really good choice. Yeah, the little M2 Mini. Yeah. That's yeah. A, like, if you're just, if you're just kind of doing, you know, WordPress sites or like just Honestly, basic. If you're doing yeah. WordPress sites, go pick up a used M1 Mac Mini because 
Yeah. I, I have one of those floating around and every time I sit down and I use it, I, th- I just think to myself, I can't believe this is a Mac mini. It's so stinking fast. Even the M1 version. So, well, apparently the studios are, I've not tried one, but they're a pair. They're like baby, uh, you know, Mac pro minis or whatever you want to call them. Mac pro diet Coke edition. You know, I had a strange realization that my MacBook Max has slowed down, not in the execution of tasks, but in the everyday use, mm-hmm. boot up, shut down, and specifically app launches. And the reason why I noticed this is I spent a week using Fedora on that MacBook with the Asahi patches. Of course you did. Yeah, it was for a review and love. And um, the applications on Linux launch faster than they do in macOS. And one of the things I distinctly remember about my first impression with the M1 Max was instant application launch, like no dock bounce. The moment I click the icon, the application window is on the screen. That's gone away on macOS. It's like you know, I'm on an Intel machine. When I click Firefox, I get three bounces before it loads. You know, same with Chrome. It's the startup times have gone into the turlet. I, I don't know how to explain it. It's, it. I've lost a lot of the benefits and it really makes me think I just got to wipe and install, but I don't have the time. It's not what I use that machine for. That's weird. Yeah, I've mine's still stupidly fast. I'm just a, I, I kind of regret getting the laptop version because uh, I just sit at my desk anyway, and the odds of me pouring a Hendrix Orbium <laughs> directly into it, which the Orbium is the one infused with absinthe, so bad things can happen. It, it seems very dangerous. <laughs> or, or honestly, I've spilt so much green tea because I, I like to try to pick it up not by the handle. And uh, I'll put you this way: I melted my electric kettle because <laughs> I overfilled it. And yeah, got to have all I, that good tea. I if don't hire me to design your water park because it's just gonna be bad. It's whatever. Tailscale.com slash coder. Go right now to get a free personal account for now up to one hundred devices and unlimited subnets. It's a great way to support the show while you check out a simple, secure network for a team of any scale built on top of WireGuard. Yeah, that's right. It's a zero-config VPN. You can get up and running in minutes. It makes the traditional VPN systems look like old and busted 1980s technology. And Tailscale's perfect for software developers out there that need to build a network where they can work on multiple systems, maybe something on a VPS, maybe something on a local VM, maybe something in Docker. All of that is super easy to bring onto your Tailnet, along with your favorite mobile device, Android, iOS, Raspberry Pi. I don't know which. Maybe you got a Raspberry Pi in a box. I don't know easy to get Tailscale going on all of that. And because it is running on top of WireGuard noise protocol, you know it's super secure. You can trust your data. It's how I sync everything. I have no inbound ports anymore. And then you can leverage tools like Tailscale Send and Tailscale SSH and now Funnel to really take this to a full production operation for an individual or an entire team. And now for free, when you go to tailscale.com slash coder, they just improve the free plan from 20 devices to 100 devices. And they have talked about how they do this sustainably on their blog. They talk about the business logic behind it. They talk about the infrastructure behind it. They're an impressive company. They're different than everybody else out there. And it's something to take note of. So go try it out. Get Tailscale for free for up to 100 devices. It's absolutely fantastic. And with unlimited subnet routing, now you can put devices that you can't natively install software on onto your Tailnet. An example of this is my home router. I, it's an appliance. I just can't put the Tailscale client on there. But with subnet routing, I can now get to my home router and I can even change internet connections live, swap over to a different connection with my router. I have, I have multiple connections. And Tailscale just reconnects. Doesn't care if there's double NAT, manages all the firewalls at each end of all the devices and just creates a peer-to-peer mesh network. Beautiful. Love it. Going to change your game. Go try it out and support the show. Tailscale.com slash coder. That's tailscale.com slash coder. You're not going to be surprised by this. Nobody listening is going to be surprised by this, but I wanted to get it in the show so we have it in the record. Uh-oh. Attacking Copilot for emitting GPL code is becoming a marketing strategy. Like, that's kind of cute. The folks over at Codium, which create a competitor to GitHub Copilot to help automatically generate source code, have put out a hit piece as a way to promote their tool 
But I think at the same time, raise some pretty fair observation, essentially that they've been able to demonstrate over and over again in a reproducible way that GitHub Copilot trained on GPL code. And when you use their non-permissive filters, they don't actually work properly. And so you still accidentally end up with GPL code in your project, even if you've implicitly asked it to filter that stuff out. There are some shenanigans here, though. All right. So you have to do some tweaking of the settings. And I, I, I'm not going to say it doesn't read GPL code, right? But, you know, this reminds me of all the like, we made chat GPT say something crazy. Well, mm. yeah, you can, you can write your prompt in a way that's, you know, cherry picking bad examples. Or setting up a context in which it behaves poorly. This is an argument that's going to keep happening. Longtime listeners sent it to us on Twitter. I get it, right? Like my inner, like, let's not try to hobble new technology over, you know, kind of cherry picked. I am starting to feel that instinct kick in for myself for this stuff too. Yeah. Well, also like I was interested in Codium and still kind of am, but this is like a scummy look to me. This is. Yeah. It's like, kind of like, it's, show, it's almost kind of throwing shade in a way on the entire industry in order just to get ahead. Because these questions are kind of dark clouds hanging over the entire industry. And so when you then go and promote yourself as we've solved this problem, you're basically implicitly stating this is a problem for the entire industry. Not a great look. It's not a great look. Like you don't, you don't see, you know, Accenture and uh, I forgot the other big one, the big like IT consulting companies running around just beating the crap out of each other like publicly because it's... It's gross. I, I don't know. And ironically, Codium looks really good. Like their enterprise offering yeah. in particular is, is very interesting. But I, I don't see a world where someone is a, particularly an enterprise or a business customer for Codium, that isn't also going to evaluate GitHub Codepilot. You'd be an idiot not to, right? It's, it's the GitHub Microsoft solution. Um, Amazon now has, I forgot from last week, their player, although they're much more limited, right? They have a... a a smaller language uh, collection, so to speak. Yep. Yep. I don't. Maybe I'm getting older. I used to throw a lot of shade myself. If we have a uh, 500 and something episodes of it, <laughs> I sort of feel like maybe just focus on what you're doing and worry less about your competitor. It did get some attention, I suppose. So it has that advantage. Well, it did work. It hit Hacker News, right? Like, yeah. it, maybe it worked. I don't know. I think the reason why it clicked with both you and I is we can definitely sense. This is going to be a major headwind for this industry, and it's probably going to be a long process, and it almost seems inevitable that it results in more centralization, because what it'll do is it'll be a system where the companies with the most vetted, copyright-safe models are going to be the ones that get to charge the most, because it'll be inherently the most expensive if you're going to go license from Reddit and Stack Exchange and every music library. And you're going to write, you know, checks for all this different stuff. Well, then it's going to end up at a large company centralized behind an API that you'll pay per API call. for. What large company likes to sell you APIs that has the leading product in this category already? Hmm. hmm. Yeah. So and, and that's, I think, also why I kind of hate to see all of this hyperbole about the dangers of chaos GPT. You know, Wes and I were playing with auto GPT yesterday evening. It's a hoot, dude. It's a real, it's a real hoot. We had it, um, we asked Auto GPT to create podcast show notes in markdown format for an episode about IPFS, the inter the nice interplanetary file system. And yeah, yeah. it figures out, okay, I need to go research what this is. And it creates a comprehensive show doc that gives you an introduction, background, a, a snapshot of the ecosystem where things are at right now, some of the top apps and services to check out, you know, like, like you might actually formulate a real show and it, it's, it's spun up agents to do research about IPFS. It's spun up something to create the show notes and it just does all of it. And, um, Wes told it, you know, don't do more than like a hundred API calls or something like that. So you can set some limits in there so you don't charge up all blow yeah. your, yeah, yeah. It's really neat. God, I just love to not even have to have that API. I'd love to be able to just be running on a really powerful system here or on a VPS or on some sort of distributed. So that's like, I think one of, so I was trying to look into Codium a little bit. I, I mean, I think these guys, or gals, I don't know. I don't actually know who runs Codium. I think they have an impressive product. I wouldn't be shocked, 
right? If you look at their enterprise offering, they talk about a uh, single container image setup. I feel like that could be on your hardware. And when they say container, I think they've heard the good news of Docker, but I don't know that for a fact, but I will reach out on their Discord because... Uh, yes, it does look like they have something that's self-hosted, including, they say, on-prem servers and in-cloud VPCs. To me, that's the that's the kind of the the money shot here, right? Say, listen, enterprises who are afraid of, you know, whatever shenanigans GitHub's doing over there, we promise that we, right, we contractually promise that we don't look at GPL or running virulent or infectious code, for lack of a better term. I know I just quoted Bomber. If you're old enough, you know what I'm quoting. <laughs> you do. You're like, yes, you did. I love a good Bomber ref. You know what? If you look back at poor Bomber with some grace, the guy wasn't wrong about a lot of things. He was a little bit of a buffoon, but I think it was like he was trying to be a cheerleader, right? He was, I don't know, I like. Oh, for sure. He was trying to get everybody hyped up, yeah. which was a, you know, uh, it was a style back then. Yeah, now you do yoga and like buy 15 houses and your name is Adam Newman and still the best thing on Apple TV is we crashed <laughs> and I watch it all the time. In fact, I I'm starting to do yoga myself because I heard that my uh, revenue and my daily active users will go right up. So. Oh, we should give that a go. It's hmm. surprisingly strenuous. I wonder what happens the first time Microsoft buys a company that's all in on something like Copilot or something, and they can just go back and review all of their history and see what kind of developers they have. <laughs> well, right. That's what I'm saying. Like the, 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 the Codium, to me, the pitch here is like, hey, guys, you could just like run this in your basement. You know, we'll give you some kind of support. I mean, I'm just going to read it, right? New enterprise, everything in the individual plan deployed entirely in the customer's VPC or on-prem. Ta-da. Local fine tuning on your code base, meaning you can. That's nice. Yep. You can trade it against your own local code. Single container setup, blah, blah, blah. Enter enterprise use of statistics. Priority support, which probably means you have like the phone number of somebody you can call and yell at, I would yeah. assume. Let's see what the pricing is. I'm going to go check out their pricing page. Oh, it's contact oh, us. Contact. <laughs> yeah. They do have a free individual plan. Uh, I don't want to contact. I just want to know what the pricing is, guys. I'll do it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> You'll find out. Huh? Yeah, I'm curious, you know, because that on-prem thing is a pretty compelling idea. I I know lots of scaredy cat enterprises that would be that are interested in this stuff, but like, yeah, we're not gonna get sued by some Linux beard who's like GPL, GPL, GPL. They're out there, I suppose, because it seems like they're brewing. It'll be interesting to see where that goes. They are great home brewers, actually. I would drink Linux beer, Pit Pilsner, or Ale can or attest. Definitely. There is a strange, large crossover between Beards, Linux, and Brewing. Yeah, I'm, I'm still on the model train. Tr train uh, thing, <laughs> yeah, right. So. Ask not what your podcast can boost for you, but what you can boost for your podcast. Of course, a shout out to Mouse Down Mike, who uh, came in as our baller uh, this week with his 155, 554 sap boost. But getting to the uh, regular uh, boost messages, uh, Deleted came in with 50,000 sats, also a very healthy boost. Thank you, sir. I hoard that which your kind covered. Deleted says, I always appreciate the real takes and predictions on Coder, whether they are correct or not. Damn. I, make if, I know. Well, you know, like, which ones aren't? We probably just forget. <laughs> Windows 8 being a good idea. Metro, I yeah, lost lots of Yeah, that's true. Money. People usually do tell, call us out when we get it wrong. So I, I, he says, I make a few predictions too and have a decent track record myself. I, my, my worst one, though, was when I predicted that WebOS would supplant Android as one of the main mobile platforms. And then HP announced they were killing WebOS two days later. <laughs> oh. Ooh, but you know what? What is dead cannot die. WebOS is still on True. LG TVs. And it's the best. They are the best smart TVs I hear over and over. It is the best smart TV. I, I had the HP WebOS tablet. I think we talked about it like Eight oh yeah man ago. yeah i loved that thing that yeah. thing was awesome yeah right? it's uh, yeah. it was great on a tablet it was so good there's a parallel it. universe out there uh he wraps up by saying i'm still bitter about that one and the developer story on android is still terrible amen deleted that is such a great story if anybody else else wants to boost in on a tech bet that they made wrong <laughs> it went real wrong like that no matter i mean it might not have had any consequences but i'd still love to know because that's uh that makes me smile Noob Steve comes in with 32,065 sets. Oh, yeah. Hey, nice, another nice boost. Uh, he says, this is a zip code boost. And if my math is right, Mike, he's a somewhat local. Orange Park, Florida. Woo! Uh, which I think is maybe north of you by north 
east of you by a bit. Uh, sounds about right. But yeah, it's, uh, you know, in the same states. Florida is long, really long. I was looking at, I was looking at it on the map and poof. It is a, a very uh, well-endowed state, yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, he says, uh, I'm kind of shocked we haven't seen a religious cult pop up thinking that ChatGPT is the second coming. Maybe it's brewing right God. now. I think people just need to calm down. But uh, all this AI talk makes me want to go watch some Battlestar. Fracking toasters. I know Mike loves Roslyn, but I sure love do. me some Boomer. Valid choice. With the Star Trek Picard season three seeming so well received, uh, with the old cast coming on, you know, you know, they're all like in their seventies, except for Pat Stu, who's in his eighties. Maybe bat, maybe there's going to be a Battlestar. I honestly would love to see. We flash forward on Battlestar Galactica. You know, they've basically built a pretty successful, doing well colony, but a rogue group of Cylons show back up, and our heroes have to get back in action one more time. That'd be pretty great. I'd watch a little mini series. Yeah, but th- remember the end of Battlestar? Yeah. I'm very disappointed. How would that work? Because they would all be dead, except for, right? Well, Your heroes are all dead. If you have old Ronald write it, you just say, well, God, and then he just fixes it. You know, he just writes, he pulls the old God card. It solves the problem. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we had some of their DNA material in a vault or something crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're all, they're all kind of like in some sort of bat vats. And that's why they don't look quite right. Um, minimum effort comes in, I'm going to guess, with 8,000 sats. He says, please bring back Tech Snap with Chris and Alan Jude. Those were the best episodes of Jupiter Broadcasting, then followed by Coda Radio. That's fair. You know, old Alan Jude. Oh, he does. He does love his BSD. You know, that was such an era, you know, and that's where we first ever, the first time we ever did an on-air segment on Bitcoin over like 11 years ago now. And um, I just casually mentioned in the segment that while I was prepping for that segment, I had mined 50 Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> wow different times uh minimum effort i'll link you to darknet diaries i've uh, our buddy brent raves about darknet diaries all the time so that might be entertaining you mined 50 bitcoin yeah it was a lot and that was just a fraction of what i and that was on the cpu too back when it was on the oh CPU. my god stop i know i know pablo Pierre comes in with seven thousand seven hundred seventy seven cents he says hey guys in episode 513 you talked about switching to vs code and in Linux Unplugged, LogSec came up, or I think it's LogSeq. I've switched all of my task notes and knowledge base notes to VS Code using basically markdown files synced with C file and some useful plugins. He mentions like a markdown all in one, the markdown checkbox plugin, markdown extended. Wow. Markdown image size. Oh. And markdown notes. Okay, I'll take a look at some of those. He writes, I have snippets with templates for notes, tasks, interview scripts, etc. It's all very searchable. And I use tags. And, you know, like hash, hash mark tags. And it'll auto-complete when I'm writing them. I can use links like knowledge-based apps. This has been my best day-to-day setup. And I'm not locked into a setup because my notes are just markdown files. That is a, that is a really VS Code-centric setup, and I like it. What I have kind of settled on, because LogSeq didn't quite work for my brain, is I've settled on Joplin. Mm. But I use VS Code as the front end using, there's a, an extension that essentially connects to the web clipper connection that the, the Joplin app runs a little web server kind of thing on the back end or whatever it is, some sort of server to listen for a web clipper connection. And VS Code can use that to write and save all of your markdown files and your images right into Joplin. And I like that because of the search capabilities of Joplin, but also it means the wife can just open the Joplin app on her phone and she has a very straightforward, simple interface and I can use VS Code on, on my side. So it's a pretty good setup, but man, I could see taking to the next level with some of those extensions. So I will check them out. Tom's dad comes in with 5,000 sats. I've heard you guys talk a few times about health and fitness as a developer. Well, being one myself, I've spent much of my professional career being, well, let's say pear-shaped. For me, and I believe the research shows this, it's not what you do for exercise, but building a habit. The thing that formed my habit was the New York Times seven-minute workout. It's easy to get started. It only takes seven minutes, and getting the habit started can become the gateway to more exercise and a better lifestyle. I'm now 53, and I'm in the best shape of my life, and I still sat at my desk all day long. Thanks for the great show. Tom's dad, that's great to hear. I have to be honest. I was thinking recently maybe of trying out Apple Fitness. Have you ever tried it? Apple Fitness? Yeah. I was thinking, of, I was thinking about giving it a go just to like stretch and move my, my fat bod. I use the watch stuff to like track when I'm on like the Peloton or walking 
Yeah. But I don't, I don't, you mean like the TV stuff? Yeah. No, I've never done it. I'm it's just been, you know, here what happens is, is I actually do a pretty good job staying active right around this time of year until sort of the end of fall. But here in the Pacific Northwest, and this is just what it is, but like from the end of October to about right now, the end of April, we don't see the sun. And it's, it's rainy and it's gray. And this is our rep, where our reputation for rain and all that. This is where it comes from is this period of, it's like the wet season. And so I just, and like I get, I leave in the morning, it's dark and it's frosty out. And I get home in the evening and it's dark and cold and it's dinner time. And then it's like, you don't want to go out because you're warm and you're eating dinner and now you're watching TV. And that cycle just goes on for like seven months or more. And then I get out and I'm like, oh yeah, let's go for walks. So I can track it and do you some yard work. And then I'll like even try to somehow track the yard work, like saying it's like a hike or something. I don't know if anybody track, if anybody knows any hot tips on tracking yard work with your watch, let me know and your Apple watch. But I, uh, I tried this winter. I, I tried to like get out in the garage and the first stage of that was clean up the garage. And then the second stage was start working on the cars. Yeah. And that's a lot of physical labor. So towards the end of winter, I realized, no, I could do something in a garage, but yeah, I need to get better about it. Cause I know in the back of my mind, it's a use it or lose it kind of situation. Tom's dad comes in with another 5,001 sats to chime in on the rumored Apple headset. I finally tried immersed on an Oculus two. It's at immersed.com. I was intrigued after reading a medium article about using setup for coding all day. Now, I think we actually tried Immersed as well. I think that was one of the apps you and I tried that lets you create a total virtual office space and you can have virtual monitors that pulls in your actual desktop and float them in space. It's an app that has potential. Anyways, I'm sorry. Tom's dad goes on to say, I was intrigued after reading this article. Imagine taking a multi-monitor setup for putting it in your face on a plane, maybe when you're camping with Starlink, anywhere. From a resolution perspective, the Oculus was a disappointment. Being able to read text. Yeah, you had to really make it big, in my experience, to read the text. Still, the experience has made me hopeful for the whole VR thing, and it's not that it's not dead, and that Apple will release something worthy. It was quite a compelling experience. Have you tried such a setup? I think this is what got you and I kind of tepid bullish, is like, if they could pull off something like Immersed, like, an, like if Apple gave you, let's just say, six exceptionally well-designed virtual offices. And if they had an M2 Mac, essentially, in that headset, or an M2 iPad with equivalent apps that you could actually use to get work done, you take that headset with you, and you have your entire office with your silly things on the, on the sticky board, your favorite chair with a view of the water and a fireplace going, and this massive cool screen setup that has everything laid out just the way you like it. And all of the apps just pop right back up because they're running locally on that device. It's not even a remote connection to your PC like the Oculus is, but in this case, it is the PC. Uh, yeah, I just don't think it's going to come out that mature. And it's going to have to be really impressive for the probable cost. Here's how they do it. Today, we're introducing three revolutionary devices. Well, of course. A brand new way to communicate with your family. Oh, God. One of the fastest Mac desktops we've ever made and a gaming device that'll immerse you like nothing you've ever used. Right? <laughs> That's how they do it. <laughs> oh, Lord. In their uh, fancy video style. Now, yeah, that's... I don't know. Uh, maybe not. Maybe not. Uh, Mere Mortals podcast comes in with a row of ducks. Those crazy VC degens. I like that phrasing. I might just have to start using it. Feel free, mere mortals. Let's spread the word. VCs are basically just DGENs. I was listening to a podcast and I couldn't believe what I was hearing about how ruthless they are about what they just, the arrogance, all of it. No humility. Ha, ah, it's, uh, it's, it's really quite rich. And uh, DPG comes in with our very last boost. Coming in hot with the boost. <laughs> hey, Chris and Mike, boosting to ask if you guys have thought about, quote, funding goals, end quote, for boosts. I'm thinking a Coda radio with Mike in studio would be worth boosting towards. Love the show. You know, if you ever did get out here for Linux Fest, we could totally do an in studio Coder because it's just right down the road. You know, I don't know about like goals for that DPG, yeah. but the ad market is looking real bad. My friends are telling me things are grim and getting grimmer. And so we may have like not so much a funding goal, but like if you don't boost, we're going to die. So that could be a thing at some point. So save your sats or at least keep sending in boosts. Keep it. Keep it coming. Also, you can support the show directly by becoming a member. That's some infrastructure stuff there. You know, foundational. 
at coderqa.co. And you get an ad-free version of the show. And I suppose if we didn't have sponsors, well, then I'd just create something special for you. What a world that'd be. The members would world. be completing something that the member sh- feed was designed to help. That's a weird, that's a weird head job. I got to, I got to work on that. While I'm uh, doing that math, you got anywhere you want to send people? Uh, go to alice.dev if you want some beautiful automation stuff for your business. And, and you won't have to pay Mike by the API call, you know? No, you don't pay by the API call. <laughs> the show is at Coder Radio Show on Twitter, and the network is at Jupiter Signal. Go check out jupiterbroadcasting.com. I'm going to recommend Linux Action News. Ooh. Nice and tight, in and out. Get you what you need to know about Linux and open source. It's a nice little uh, addition, I suppose, to the Coder program. And you get to hear from our buddy, Wes Payne. Links to what we talked about today at coder.show slash 515. You'll find our contact form over there, our RSS feeds, and a bunch more. Thanks so much for joining us on this week's episode of the Coder Radio program. See you right back here next week.